Thanks, Brett. Hi, everyone. My name is Elijah. Um, I'm the convener of the Labor Science Network, which is a science advocacy group within the Labor Party. Uh, the topic of tonight's discussion is science, politics, and populism in the 21st century. Now, we chose this topic uh, because of its importance and particularly in the current climate. It goes without saying that science is at the centre of life these days, both in terms of policy and economics. But it's also at the forefront of the defining political challenges of our time, this climate change and our response to the COVID-19 pandemic. It seems that accompanying the increasing ubiquity of science in our lives has been the re-emergence of populism, characterised by the dismissal, disavowal or uh, opposition to scientific institutions and other forms of policy and expertise. In conjunction with the rise of populism, we've also seen these movements being informed by a resurgence in conspiracy theories, such as the anti-vaccination um, theories, uh, theories around climate change, and even recently, theories connecting, for example, COVID to 5G. Populism and the growing impact of conspiracy theories therefore present a significant challenge for all of those of us who are interested in science and evidence-based policy, and that includes people within the party and also those in government seeking to anchor their policies in science and evidence. These dynamics also affect the electoral prospects for parties like the ALP. So this is a very important topic for society as a whole, but also uh, the party itself. And to discuss this pressing challenge, we are privileged to have three eminent speakers with us. Uh, firstly, Deputy Opposition Leader Richard Miles, who's calling in this evening from Victoria. So I hope you're safe and sound down there, Richard. Secondly, former Chief Scientist of Australia and former Vice Chancellor of the ANU, recipient of the Order of Australia, and there's several other things that could be said about him. And one of the most, one of Australia's most eminent scientist, Professor Ian Chubb. And third, calling in from the UK on a sunny Thursday morning in London is Annabelle Bly, a researcher and journalist for The Conversation in the UK and editor of their Anthill podcast with expertise in conspiracy theories. So I'm going to jump straight into the questions. This first part, I want to look at what this challenge really means. So Richard, I'd like to throw to you firstly to set the scene. From the perspective of Australian politics, what do we mean by populism in Australia and how does it present challenges for science-based policies and politics? Um, well, it's a, it's a good question, Elijah, and firstly, thank you to, to you and, and to Brett, and it's great to be here today with, um, or this evening with, with Ian and Annabelle. Um, I was thinking about that question, and um, I think the, uh, the best description for me of what populism is um, comes from a story that uh, I had or experienced with um, uh, Bob Catter, of all people. Bob and I were uh, travelling around North Queensland on a parliamentary committee, and um, uh, and as part of that, uh, Bob was um, uh, speaking to a range of people in, in different and, and in and in different rooms, and he would be saying things that um, inevitably got a lot of support. Um, but we would go from one meeting to the next, and his view would literally change from one meeting to the next. Um, and I found it deeply frustrating until I worked out what he was doing. And that is, Bob wasn't really concerned about what he had to say from the point of view of what he believed. He was just trying to read the room and work out what they wanted to hear. Um, and from that point of view, he did it exquisitely. Um, and that really is what populism is. It's a mirror. It's telling people what they want to hear. Um, it's nothing more than that. Um, and, um, and in that sense, what it is not um, is based on evidence. It's not based on... Uh, trying to solve a problem. It's not trying, based on trying to make the world better. It's simply being reflecting what people want to hear. Um, and, and from that point of view, it presents an enormous challenge because when we've got real problems and challenges out there in society as we do at the moment, um, you know, we need evidence-based thinking to come up with solutions um, and populism is the antithesis of that. Sure, sure. And look, you know, we will drill down, I think, into, into some of the 
ways in which populist rhetoric in this country has certainly affected, for example, political campaigning, which I think a lot of people here will be curious to hear about. So look, you know, I want to, you know, and we will also explore the sort of role of uh, some of the other parties, such as One uh, Nation and, and Clive Palmer's party as well. You know, I want to throw to you, Ian, you know, I'd like to you now to outline a perspective on this challenge from the scientific establishment. From your experience as chief scientist, what do you see as the challenges facing science communication and acceptance from the perspective of, of scientific institutions? Thanks, Sarge. The, the, um, so I agree with Richard's definition. I mean, I think that's um, what we see uh, much too often. And um, indeed, I'll get back to the communication issue, but but um, three of us gave some evidence as witnesses, invited witnesses to a Senate inquiry into the impact of water quality on the Great Barrier Reef. This is, this is one of the most complex uh, living systems in the world. Uh, it's big, um, but it's presented as if uh, farming practices, for example, overuse of fertilizer or use of fertilizer, um, use of pesticides, they don't get to the outer reef, so it doesn't matter. Um, the Great Barrier Reef is uh, huge, 350,000 square kilometres, bigger than Italy. It's not one big reef, it's 3,000. There are thousands of um, species of coral, 1,600 species of fish, um, 15 species of seagrasses. And so the real issue is how does that complex work together? And when you get a bunch of people who don't want to hear the evidence, but want to curry favour for whatever reason, then you get the outcome that we got at that inquiry where experts were talked over, belittled, bullied, harassed, not me personally, but I saw it happen to others or heard it happen to others. And, um, and so you think to yourself, well, you know, how do we get the message across to people? How do we get a, a community in Australia where, um, we're trying to get across a complex message in acceptable terms, that is, that is terms that um, uh, non-experts can, can grasp, which is not sort of, you know, talking down to or, or diminishing the importance of their questions, because they're all important, but we have to be able to get the message across. So I've always said that scientists in many respects, um, uh, and, and even our very best scientists, um, they don't speak well to the public because they want to do what scientists do. So, you know, it's highly likely, highly probable. They don't speak in certainties. They deliver a bit of a mixed message. And depending, you know, some people can deliver a mixed message fairly well. Some people don't do it at all well. And then somebody comes in along the side and says, well, who cares? It's, we've got, only got to worry about the coral uh, on the outer shelf and nothing about the inshore um, um, ecosystem that will give us a chance of um, protecting a reef until we get global warming under control because that's the biggest threat to it. And so, um, you know, we, we, I think, increasingly understand the fact that we have to get the message out in, in, in broadly, not overly technological, but accurate um, terms to people who are interested in the issues, um, but are not necessarily uh, experts on coral or fish or sea grasses or turtles or breeding grounds or whatever it is, but, but explain the message. And the other thing that we've learnt, and my little group, I chair a group that advises ministers on the, on the barrier reef, um, we've just appointed a couple of behavioural scientists to our group. Before that, it was economics and, and um, science of different sorts, different levels of, uh, different uh, spread of expertise. Um, because one of the things that we've got to learn to do is to stop preaching the gloom and doom of, you know, the water's too warm and the coral doesn't survive and it can recover if the water's clean or has a better chance of surviving if the water's clean. And talking about how you persuade people who basically are um, not willingly choosing to change their behaviours, but I think could be persuaded if we get the message across in the right way. So we got a lot to do. Um, sure. Not, not lose the accuracy, not lose the fact that, that you know, there is a real issue, 
not not downplay it, not downgrade it, not sort of patronise, but get a message across to try to get the community behind uh, the urgency of action and a willingness to take action themselves. Sure. And look, I think um, something I'd like to have you drill down on further is, is some of the polling on the on the on the uh, trust in science among the community and some of the inconsistency about how some of those polls which put science science you know at the fairly high trust uh, levels versus the sort of rise of populism yeah. um, so you know I so sort of again just to set the scene I'd like to uh, now jump jump to Before we dive into exactly how Bill Gates is plotting to control us all with 5G and coronavirus, I'd like you to frame a topic of conspiracy theories for the audience, and in particular, how conspiracy theories relate to the emergence of populist uh, um, uh, thought around the world. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Elijah. Um, so, well, kind of building on what Richard and Ian have said, um, conspiracy theories fit in with populism in that they they provide very easy and clear stories and answers for very complex issues going on in the world uh, i guess the, the sort of three main characteristics of any conspiracy theory is this idea that nothing happens by accident nothing is as it seems and everything is connected so they don't give any room for chance or random events um, and they provide these very clear stories of that explain what are often incredibly complex science or global events um, and another another kind of big feature of conspiracy theories is that their logic is self-sealing so when someone really firmly believes a conspiracy theory any evidence that you throw at them that is used as evidence of the conspiracy theory itself or as part of the cover-up. Um, and maybe to bring in an element of populism that's not being touched on yet is the way that populism kind of divides the world into elites versus like the you know normal people and this idea that um, there are global elites controlling the world uh, for nefarious means. Um, and similarly, with conspiracy, conspiracy theories tend to blame these secretive powerful elites for manipulating global events. Um, but I guess it's more helpful to talk about specific conspiracy theories because what they tend to do is tap into whatever angst is going on in the world at a certain time. Um, so, you know, in the early 20th century, you had the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which was uh, this idea of like a secret cabal of Jewish elites, which basically tapped into huge amounts of anti-Semitism at the time. Um, you know, Hitler referred to it. Um, and even though that's being clearly fabricated, uh, clear, clearly pointed out as, as being a fabrication, um, it kind of keeps cropping up in anti-Semitic tropes today. Um, and then I guess increasingly what we see today is that conspiracy theories are used by politicians or used for political ends. Um, so uh, whether that's Donald Trump emerging uh, by tapping into Obamagate and the conspiracy theory that Obama wasn't born in the US and wasn't a US, wasn't a proper US citizen, so didn't qualify to be president, um, or, uh, you know, just using conspiracy theories to kind of rally a base and mm -hmm. gain support. Yeah, right. No, thank you. And look, we will be drilling down into some of the some of the uh, drivers of these theories. I've, though they are you know, quite on the fringe in some cases, we're finding that they're seeping into uh, certain uh, certain back benches in Sydney, for example, on the coalition side. Now, look, Richard, I want to throw another question at you. You talked about populism as in part driven by people wanting to see their worldview reflected back at them. I was wondering whether you could drill down a little bit more into some of the economic and cultural drivers behind the rise of populism in Australia 
For example, the rise of populist parties of Sloan Hansen's party, the rise of Clive Palmer's party. How do you see economic anxiety, cultural anxiety, and like feeding into populist um, uh, parties in Australia? Yeah, well, it's ob obviously a, <clears throat> a critical factor. I mean, populism um, and the, the yearning for it is comforting. Um, when somebody says what you want to hear and it resonates with you, that, that's, that's a comforting experience. Um, and, you know, I think we all would, you know, COVID-19 is not necessarily something you can see. There might be a whole lot of people who haven't known anyone who's had it. Um, uh, somebody says to you, it's not real. That's a comforting message. Um, now, it, it, the need for that comfort, uh, I think, is um, amplified in, in an environment where there's a lot of other pain around. So, I mean, if, if in your life um, you're struggling because of not having a job or a, a range of economic drivers um, or from, you know, a, a range of social perspectives, um, you know, seeking out a comforting message um, is is a uh, is an easy place to go, and 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 your kind of personal tolerance or ability to digest a more difficult message, which might be presenting a, 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 a you know very hard thing that we're experiencing, but nevertheless a solution to it if we walk a difficult road, you know your 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 ability to do all of that or digest all of that is is reduced if if the surrounding circumstances that you have are already pretty painful, and in that sense. You know, I think populism has risen throughout history during times of um, pain that people have experienced, and um, and you know, you you, you look at um, what happened in in Germany in the the thirties. Part of that is the economic pain that existed in in the lead up to that. There was a fertile environment for that, a message that otherwise might never have been accepted. I think the other point to make is. You know, there, there is a new media, which is which you know, twenty four seven so twenty four seven news cycle combined with with a very ever present social media, just turns the volume up on everything. Um, I don't think it gives rise to more populism, and I don't think it means that um, the ability to make an argument is harder. But if you have a difficult argument to make in the public space, which from time to time we do, and if politics is about winning hearts and minds, then actually that's what it's about, isn't it? I mean, it's about we need to make an argument for this. And you look at what the Hawke and Keating governments did in, range, in respect of a whole lot of areas. What they did was went out and made an argument which was initially unpopular, but won hearts and minds. Today, that initial burst of um, reaction, which is the unpopular reaction, comes through much louder than it ever has before. And I think it has scared people away from, um, in public life and in politics, from going off and, and making an argument to go out and win hearts and minds. I, I actually don't think it's more difficult to do, but I, I think you, that, that initial sort of hit that you get is much harder to face. And I think, um, I think in modern politics, the appetite to go out and make the argument is is not what it was um, in previous times. And I don't think that's a function of there being a great amount of populism out there. I think it's a function of the, um, the different media environment that we live in today. And I think that presents some of the challenges that we need to understand as we move forward and try and address populism. Sure. And... That's something else we will drill down to as well. I, I was going to ask another question just about how uh, the coalition has used populism more recently in the 2019 election, but it's maybe something we can get to in our Q&A. We, we have a lot of questions coming in. Ian, I'd like to go back to you now. Drilling down to the drivers of populism and anti-science perspectives that we see growing, um, uh, what... What, from your perspective uh, and your history as chief scientist, seen as the types of behavioural, demographic or social factors of respect for science on the one hand and scepticism towards science and expertise on the other? And when you answer that, can you touch on how government policy has affected trust in science among the, the broader population? So, Elijah, you kept freezing and dropping out during the course of that question. Sorry. So I'll, I'll Sorry. give you an answer to something if you can tell me if it fits your question, all right? <laughs> it's about yeah, trust in I science. I think it's easy to do it that way. Trust in science, yeah. So um, it, it's, 
it, it's always intrigued me if you look at polls that are directly relevant. Um, the uh, uh, scientists and university staff indeed are trusted quite substantially by the electorate at large, assuming those polls are accurate, which um, I don't know that they are, but they certainly um, come out with a um, repeated uh, assessment of science and scientists. And, um, you know, down the bottom end of politicians and, um, and uh, you know, a few other professions that we could probably all name. Um, so it, it's always been intriguing that uh, scientists are trusted generally, uh, clearly not by everybody, but generally. And yet when scientists want to do something about climate change, there is not enough pressure on politicians to take serious action from the community at large. So it comes back in part to communication. It comes back in part to uh, conspiracy theories uh, that um, Annabelle mentioned earlier, and they play a role in this too. And it plays a part in the way that we, we need to persuade people to change their behavior, as I said earlier. And I have, I have um, sympathy with politicians, right of, some politicians right at the moment because they are having to make really hard decisions that are very uncomfortable for a lot of people. And they've got to do it on the basis of evidence today that could be different tomorrow. And we know a fair bit, but we don't know a lot. And, and we uh, yet protect them. Uh, we want them to protect us and to lead us uh, in, in a sensible way. Um, I have no sympathy whatsoever. In fact, as a, a aging cynic, I actually despise the political process that has done nothing about climate change over 30 years of steadily increasing and better and better evidence because it's too hard. So Elijah, what it comes down to for me is leadership. And I think I would make a case that we have no vision for the country and what it could be and what it should be as we come out of this and how the policies that parties, different parties introduce to say, if we're gonna get here, we've got to do this and we've got to do this and we need money to do that. So we're going to do, and it stitches together. As I've said many times in the past, you don't just wait for a random truckload of bricks to walk, drive past you and you buy them and build a house. You have a plan for the sort of house you want to build and you go out and you get what you need to build it. And we, we have tended not to do that for a long time. Richard was right about Bob Hawke and Paul Keating. In some areas, you, you could make the same argument um, about John Howard, who you know worked hard to persuade us all that GST was not the end of the world, even though he said he wasn't going to introduce something like that. So you've got these, when, when people take a leadership role and go out of their way to try to persuade, then it seems to me that the public will respond because they know why. And I don't think we take enough time to explain why we need to do things in accessible terms, as I said earlier, um, and, and how it's going to build the country we want. Otherwise, all we've got is the sum of the parts rather than the parts being built to match the whole or to give us the whole. And, and I think for a long time now, we're just working the wrong way around. We're saying we've got to change this policy, that policy, this policy, that policy. And um, if I could say so, the Labor Party showed the disadvantage of doing that in the last election because there are a lot of policies, many of which I could support, but, but how they came all together and what, it, what Australia would be like at the end of that process seemed to be, to be the missing link in explaining to the community why they were proposing to do what they were and how it would benefit Australia and Australians in the long run. Does well, that answer the question? Yeah, I've heard? yeah, indeed. So I hope my, uh, you know, I hope the uh, five, 5G uh, uh, sort of uh, Wi-Fi here well I'm just you know I really hope that the chip he's inserted in me works now um, you know, I'm, we're gonna we're gonna throw it open to questions now and I've got a question for Annabelle from uh, Michael Cooney who's a labor stalwart and currently works at Morris Blackburn lawyers and I'll throw to you uh, Michael in one second but uh, sort of have a question of my own, which is around, um, we would love to hear what some of the research from conspiracy theory uh, uh, um, uh, 
survey says about the drivers of conspiracy theories. And I'd like now to throw to um, Michael for a question that he had. Michael, if you can, if you're there. I am. Is that coming through okay? Yep. Thank you. Thanks, mate. Annabelle, I was interested in your observations about conspiracy theories, and it sounded like you were basically describing what is really a pathology or a, a personality type almost. And I wonder if you've got a theory at all or where we could look to find more about how much what we're witnessing in politics is just the connection of principally online people who already you know, were prone to that kind of thinking really as a, as a brain issue, as it were, as opposed to what's well, kind of a politicised style of paranoid politics in climate. Um, and maybe there's a funny space in between about vaccines. You know, at the one end, there's, I suppose that's the question really. Yeah, do we think it's, is, is it growing in politics as well? Or is what we're really just seeing the connection of people who already were, or a bit wired this way? Okay, so yeah, okay, to deal with the sort of first part of the question first about the idea of it being uh, a pathology or like a certain personality type. Actually, I think that's a sort of dangerous way to think about people who believe in conspiracy theories, because actually there's a massive spectrum. Um, so there's, you've, there's a kind of diehard people that go down the rabbit hole and become super firm believers. Um, but then there's like sort of the conspiracy curious. And I think everyone to a degree is, you know, if one of the sort of psychological drivers of believing in conspiracy theories is a desire for knowledge and understanding, which, you know, everyone has. Um, and it's then sort of what you do with the evidence that matters. Um, but also when it comes to conspiracy theories, there are, there's also a difference between the people that maybe put conspiracy theories out there and the people that subscribe to them. So I think conspiracy theories have been sort of weaponized by populist politicians. Um, they might not believe in the conspiracy theories that they're putting out, um, but they often will be using them to foster a base. Or, I mean, you know, the conspiracy theories around climate change denial, they, you know, huge amounts of climate change denial is funded by um, conservative right-wing, like capitalist organizations that don't want to see, uh, that have a huge stake in climate denial. Um, and so yeah there's kind of there's there's just an important distinction to make between the people that are putting out the theories and the people that are subscribing to them to different degrees perfect answer and look i'd like to you know i'd like to drill down on some of those some of those points as well in your podcast as and and i think this also connects and is a direct relevance to both what richard and ian have said in your podcast uh, you spoke to researchers about the type of demographic groups which uh, they seem to be more susceptible to conspiracy theories. And uh, plus you've also talked about the sort of um, amplification effects of social uh, networking. And I'd, and I'd like you to speak maybe to what some of the research says about what, uh, what sort of groups, and of course it's not only these groups, uh, but who... Who is often susceptible to conspiracy, conspiracy theories in the broader population? Um, so, yeah, so I mentioned that kind of desire for knowledge as a, as a, as a driver. Um, there's a big social element to conspiracy theories that, you know, people want to um, people want to fit in to a community and feel good about themselves. Um, so a lot of people will kind of be drawn into a conspiracy theory community. They might not have, have hardcore beliefs at the start, but say, say anti-vaxxers as an example, um, anti-vaccination conspiracy theories can relate to different vaccines specifically. So I spoke to one researcher in Ireland for the podcast series who'd done some research around the HPV vaccine in Ireland and, um, basically in, in 2014, uptake was like 85%. Then there was a big anti-vax campaign and two years later it dropped down to 50%. Um, 
but then the government led a very successful campaign against the anti-vax campaign and uptake levels back up to about 75 percent and basically you had people who had who'd for decades centuries women who felt let down by the irish medical system and the irish state who were very susceptible to distrusting it um, so and then and then they basically found a community with each other where people would listen to their um, to the troubles that they'd had um, with the medical system and they it wasn't so much that it wasn't necessarily a scientific issue for them it was one of community it was they found community uh, among other people who'd had medical issues uh, that may or may not have related to the vaccine at all um, but they found kind of solace in each other and that was their kind of driver for kind of getting into this whole anti-vax campaign um, but then the government succeeded in turning it around by uh, find I mean I, I think we were going to get into this later on but the kind of the ways that um, you can kind of get people to uh, find their way out of conspiracy theory thinking but essentially the government did a really good job of getting people who had had the vaccine to talk about their experiences with it um, and there was a big element of kind of storytelling in that to to overcome you know it wasn't you know people don't always understand the science it's about who they trust and I, I don't understand all the science about climate change but I trust the majority of scientists around the world that are saying it's happening. And that's, a, that is often a big issue here. It's like, do people trust politicians? Do people trust scientists? And that's what you've got to restore. Sure. Look, I might, I might, uh, I might throw to another question in the audience. And this, this really uh, takes us to the sort of next part of this discussion, which is what, what can be done about populism and what can be done about the spread of uh, things like conspiracy theories or ill-informed beliefs. In, and um, I'd like to uh, call on Ingrid Mason, if she's available. Ingrid, you had a question on yeah, this particular I, topic. I do, thank you. My question was, what sort of cross-disciplinary collaboration is being tackled, for example, through a COLA to progress a shared communication and literacy agenda? because I see this issue as an issue that's shared right across um, uh, the research domains, um, but this is a very specific one that you're speaking to. So I'm interested in a practical kind of coalition. So just, just in case people don't know, ACOLA is the Australian Council of Learned Academies. It's like an umbrella group for science institutions. Ian, I might throw to you if that's okay. It seems to be in your, in your patch. Sure. Um, so uh, uh, a COLA functions by having the presidents of the academies agree an agenda, and it only takes one to stop it. So the problem that we have is that some of the difficult issues to tackle um, are not necessarily agreed and, don't, and aren't pursued in any depth. Um, but the reality is that we're all in this together, if I can coin a phrase, and, and the, um, a lot of our knowledge of um, climate science, for example, is pretty hardcore science. Um, but a lot of what we need to know to get people to take uncomfortable decisions that will have some impact on how they carry out their lives is, is really multi-dimensional and multi-disciplinary. And so I think we're learning better to do that now, Ingrid. I think that I would have said, um, you know, three or four years ago, it was really quite difficult. We ran a, a series when I was chief scientist called Securing Australia's Future, which published um, uh, about 10 um, uh, studies on various aspects from education through to climate indeed. And, um, and, and all of the academies were involved in that through ACOLA. But the, uh, and some of them were, were really quite good. And, and largely ignored, sadly, but, but I, th I think the issue is now much more important that we gather together knowledge and expertise that we can then say, putting that together, this is how we will get people to understand the need for change. And when you think about climate change, it's what sort of country we're gonna hand on to our kids and our grandkids. And so people are gonna to have to change at some point 
uh, it's going to require leadership from the political class and it's going to require evidence from the sweep of, democ uh, of um, academies, of disciplines, I uh, should say, that comprise the academies in this country. And, um, and we have the capacity to do it. I mean, there's a lot of very good stuff and very good people involved. It's really about getting organised and uh, agreeing that, that an objective ought to be able to persuade um, and not patronise, get to the, the deep things without being too technical, because not everybody wants to be a climate scientist. Um, and uh, I don't think immunologists want to be a climate scientist, they want to make an antibody. Um, so you've got this, this, it's complicated and it's complex, but we've got to be better at it than we are at the moment. Richard, and look, thanks, thanks for that question. That's a great question. Richard, you know, I want to build on that question, but I want to get to the pointy end of what Labor can do to deal with this phenomenon, both institutionally and more broadly. And I suppose my, my question to you is, what are some effective political strategies that parties such as Labor can use to advocate for science? How do we strike the balance, for example, in wanting to have a robust climate change policy on the one hand, but uh, being able to uh, deal with populist blowback in some quarters and in seats we need to win on the other. And do we need to fight fire with fire? Is this idea that, well, uh, maybe we can let the coalition get away with populist rhetoric, but that's not our thing. Is that something we need to revisit? Uh, well, not about fighting fire with fire. I mean, I, I, in some ways I would feel, um, if I have a political mission, it is probably to be completely against populism because um, I remember Bob Hawke once said to me that um, the enemy of good public policy is ignorance and, and I think at the heart of, the, of populism is ignorance. So I, I don't think we can ever be there. Um, look, I, I think um, what um, Ian and Annabelle have both talked about in, in the course of answering these questions goes to a communications challenge um, and I think when it comes to communicating around public policy, which has in it an element uh, of science, we are pretty ordinary. Um, and I think there's a couple of things about that. I, I, I think the um, I think the science literacy of the parliament is is hopeless. Um, and I say that as um, having been the co-convener of the Parliamentary Friends of Science for I think the last seven or eight years. Um, it, it is just really difficult to get anybody interested in any scientific topic at all. Um, and science isn't by any means uh, wholly a public endeavour. There's, there's a lot of private sector money in science, but it is pretty significantly a public endeavour. And so whether or not people understand it or not, decisions being made in Parliament House about science, and yet um, you know, the, 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 the sort of science literacy of, of the joint is not great. Um, but I also think, um, and, and sorry, I think where that then goes is that, you know, we're unable to make even the beginnings of a scientific argument. Um, I mean, and I don't mean a, a deep one, but I mean just participating in basic scientific discourse. And, and, and that goes to interrogating scientific advice. Um, so to give you an analogy here, I mean, I don't have an economics degree, but I, I know that you can't meaningfully participate in politics without understanding the basics of economics and being able to make a very basic economic argument. And in fact, I think the sophistication of the economic discussion in Australia is pretty high and you will do street stores where, where people will come up to you um, and start talking to you about, you know, tariffs or a range of things which, which have an economic dimension to them. But when it came to climate change, which at its heart was a scientific question, the best we could come up with was, you know, we believe in the science of climate change. And it used to drive me nuts, that, that, that comment. But that, that's what we were arguing. That, that was our, it was Labor's argument. We believe in the science of climate change. So let me make it completely clear. I don't believe in the science of climate change any more than I believe in the idea that two and two is four. Two and two is four. It's not a matter of belief. It's not a religion. Um, and the moment that we went out there and said, we believe in the science of climate change is the moment that we invited a whole lot of people to say, well, okay, fair enough. Well, I don't believe in it though. You know, I, I believe in a different religion. Um, and we turned a scientific argument into an article of faith and it's not, you know, it's not, this, this is reason. And, and, and we need to have people who can make a scientific argument. Um, and, and it's not beyond our wit to do that. Um, ice core samples, 
uh, taken from Antarctica give us a very precise reading of the atmosphere over the last million years. What we know from that is that the, the level of carbon dioxide now is at the highest it's ever been. Uncontested fact. No one who denies the science of climate change contests that fact. And what we know is CO2 raises, rises with the Industrial Revolution. Scientists go out and model it, point two, and the preponderance of those models come back and say that's going to give rise to an increase in climate, in temperatures in our climate. Uncontested fact, in the sense that the, no one contests that the preponderance of models show that. Those who deny climate, cha climate change will speak to those models which don't go there, but they don't deny the fact that most do. Point three, evidence in the last 20, 30 years is consistent with the preponderance of the models. Three points argued in a minute. Are we, on the basis of that, going to take the risk of not acting on climate change? Now, that's a scientific argument. It's basic, it's crude, but it's not, I believe, in the science of climate change. None of us made that argument. I think the final point here is, you know, I, I think the, the discourse between science, scientists, and government, in my experience, is the most dysfunctional discourse of any group and government in this country. And whilst I think politicians have a lot to blame, uh, be blamed for here, if I'm being honest, I think the science, climate scientists went missing in action as well. And I spoke to a number of them and they said, well, we don't want to get on a stage with crackpots and validate their argument. We'll give you the facts. It's your job to make the argument. I'm thinking, when did you ever get the privilege to not deal with crackpots? We have to deal with crackpots all the time. <laughs> Economists uh, participate in the debate all the time. You know, they're out there everywhere. Scientists don't like participating in public debate and they need to. And so how do we combat this? A better discourse with the science community, engaging the science community in the public debate and making sure that politicians see that it's their job to become more science literate so they can actually make a basic scientific argument. Mm, thanks, yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. And that certainly touches on some of the points that we've, we've heard earlier. So I'm going to throw to another audience question. Can I call on Peter Donlan? Peter, if you're there. Yes, I'm here. Hi, Peter. Yes, look, my question was um, the interesting contrast about um, the lack of action, lack of interest in climate change versus what we're seeing now, where virtually every premier, every prime minister, every health minister stands up there with a scientist and talks about what we need to do to deal with this particular pandemic. So my question really is, is, that, is this a fundamental problem between um, dealing with the long term versus dealing with an immediate problem? So maybe if Ian, uh, Ian may want to try and address that question. I, I certainly have a view on it. I think the, uh, the short answer is yes. I think we're in an era of transactional politics and how do we get, you know, what do we spend, what do we get for it and does it get, it through, get us through the next election? I told you I was an ageing cynic, but, but I don't see that the investment that you need to make for something that is not immediately affecting the lives of all Australians, um, it had a serious effect in, uh, in, uh, over this past summer and um, you know, who will forget the film of residents on the Meetung beach and the pier and so on. And, and okay, we have an argument about whether climate change causes bushfires. I don't think that's the issue. It didn't actually cause the bushfires, but it made them worse because the country was tinder dry because the rainfall patterns have changed amongst other things in this country. It hasn't moved away from the southeast and the southwest in, 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 in measurable quantities. So, so I, think, I think part of it goes back to what I said earlier. A, a vision for the country gives you 30 years to work towards something and you tell us how you're going to get there and we make a judgment call against that with a legitimate conflict of ideas that will come from different political perspectives. I think we see too much of vote for us because we aren't them and, and we get through some transaction to get to a particular short-term point when and COVID was a good example. So the Prime Minister, his stocks were down in the basement by the, by the ham-fisted way he handled the bushfires in the southeast, particularly. Um, so what do you do with that? 
um, the, the, it, it would have stayed there and we would have been talking about sports, rorts and all this other stuff. Instead, we've all been distracted, importantly so and, and, and necessarily so, by COVID-19. And so when you see a uh, Prime Minister, for example, stand alongside Brendan and say, we'll keep the schools open, tell them why, Brendan, we'll close the schools, tell them why, Brendan. I think the community reacted by um, seeing that the um, political class was listening to expertise, real expertise, and, and taking their advice and implementing fairly practical policies and processes. And I saw the Prime Minister um, about two months after it all started, described in a newspaper as the father of the nation. And um, I, I, so the, the, sh the shift, uh, and, and I've been asked to write 300 words for another journal on what I hope we learned from 2020, that this is because I wrote something last year for the same journal. And they've asked a few people who have done that to come up with 300 words. I couldn't do that. I came up with 450, but I am an academic, so you got to use more words than you're allowed. Um, but uh, but I, I said that one of the things that I hope we learn from that is how important it is for the community community to understand that the decisions that have been made uh, by parliaments and parties appropriately do have an evidence base behind them. And they're not just some ideological drivel that is that is expounded by some section or subsection or idiosyncratic person. They, they actually have a solid basis. And for a lot of the challenges that we face in this country, there will be science involved in the solutions, the mitigation or the adaptation. And, and we need to recognise that and then communicate it as we've talked about earlier. So it, it, it's not easy, it's not straightforward. If it was really easy, we'd have done it long ago. Um, and it's easy to pick it off um, by people who don't want to hear, don't want to listen, happy, you know, p politicians, some of whom we've dealt with in the last couple of weeks, quite happy to be ignorant because it means that they don't have to accommodate uh, the overwhelming mass of evidence. Um, but they can just say what they want to say and some people will believe them. And that's the tragedy in this situation, that, that we haven't organised well enough to get that the message is out and give people a choice. I mean, I'm not going to tell people what to do. I, I would rather that we as a scientific community told people the facts, maybe what the options are, and then it becomes a public community, political leadership issue. And we keep saying, you know, there's more evidence that the uh, ice shelf in Antarctica is melting at a faster rate. Greenland land has lost billions of tons of ice in the last couple of summers. But these sort of things are all important for a community that has to make a choice and has to make a decision. So our job is to try to inform it um, in the best way we can and for the community to put uh, their influence, their capacity to influence the policy and political process so that legislation passes that does something good for the country. Sure. And look, apologies, there is an alarm in the background. I think it's the alarm of of, uh, of uh, uh, the uh, country feeling that science isn't being paid attention to enough. I want to now take some of those points with Richard and Ian made and sort of track back to, the, to, to you, uh, Annabelle, and uh, sort of what, what can we learn from ways that, um, or from effective strategies to deal with conspiracy theories what can we learn from that, you know, as a means of pushing back against scepticism um, in, uh, in science? In, um, in your podcast, you talked about there are uh, uh, lessons from de-radicalisation, being able to appeal to scepticism, inoculating people against conspiratorial thinking. I'm curious as to how you see some of these strategies being able to be used to, if you like, bolster people's robustness so that they sort of keep a sense of trust in science. Yeah, so I guess one of the most uh, remarkable uh, strategies for um, stopping belief in conspiracy theories is this idea of inoculating people uh, in the first place, uh, which, which speaks to a lot of what's been said today um, about the importance of communicating science well. Because um, basically studies have shown that 
if you give people the correct information before they read about a conspiracy theory, or even better, tell them, inform them about the correct information, and then also warn them that there are people out there who are uh, throwing out misleading information, they are way less likely to believe in that conspiracy theory in the first place. Um, so getting ahead of it, getting, getting the good science out there in the first place is, is incredibly important. Um, and that's an issue of education, but also just governments being able to communi communicate a lot better what's going on. Um, and I think you've seen that a lot with coronavirus around uh, the, just the confusion about, about what's going on, um, which, you know, conspiracy theories thrive in times of confusion because um, they provide these really easy answers and explanations. Um, and then in terms of the lessons from de-radicalization, um, you know, that's... That's all about um, former former members of those communities expressing regret, and um, and that's you know once once someone does believe in a conspiracy theory, it's a lot harder to dig them out of the rabbit hole, um, and that just takes that's going to take a huge amount of time and a huge amount of trust. Um, so I think nipping it in the bud in the first place is is incredibly important. And then the other thing is just dealing with the underlying issues. Um, as to why various conspiracy theories take hold. Um, so in the West, a massive conspiracy theory is, this, is the great replacement theory. Um, this idea that, uh, so in Europe, this idea that um, immigrants from the Middle East or Africa are gonna take, are taking over. Um, and uh, you know, in, the, in the US, they have, they have a similar one. Um, and you know that's that's uh, that ties into issues of globalization. Um, you know, how do you unpick the harm that's done to certain communities by stuff like globalization or technological change? These are huge, complex issues that um, of, of dealing with of like making economies that work for everyone. Um, so yeah, it's it's a it's a big challenge. Mm, mm, right. Look, uh, we've only got four minutes left uh, in the panel, so I might throw to Ian and then Richard for, for a couple of uh, final thoughts. Ian, if I could ask you to maybe chime in just with some sort of general final thoughts on, you know, maybe the one or two key policy policy areas that you feel parties should focus on in order to really help solve this problem. Uh, you're on mute, sorry. I must have touched something. That's okay. No, I'm sorry about that. Um, I saw yesterday that Alban, um, uh, Albanese gave a speech on, um, maybe it was the day before, on regional development and clever regions and stuff. Well, I think that's an example of what we need to do. Um, I mean, I'm not surprised that people whose livelihood is built around fossil fuels, Hunter Valley Gully, wherever it happens to be, is, is rendered anxious by the fact that we're going to have a net zero carbon by 2050. So the first thing I'd do is I'd explain what the word net means, because it doesn't mean we'll never burn fossil fuels again. It means that if we do, at whatever level, they'll be more than adequately offset. And we need to get a message out to the community like that. And that, and that as part of Australia, we will look after the people whose present livelihoods are affected by that and um, by those decisions. And we have 30 years to get there, but it's not tomorrow afternoon. It requires a long time, long term strategy and persuasively told. So I would be, I would be, um, and finally I would say, I was a fan, I am a fan of Henry Parks. And when he announced the Australian Federation in the early 1890s, he proposed a toast and the four words he used were up in Sydney Town Hall um, in lights on the 1st of January 1901 and it was called One Nation, uh, One People, One Destiny. One People, One Destiny. And I think that's still a driving philosophy for this country. We believe we're egalitarian. I don't think the evidence for that is as flash as it might once have been. And I don't think that they were um, perfectly um, uh, adjusted to what that all means back in those days. But the principle of saying we, we are looking after people who need the support, not, not the help in a sense, but the support, so that if things change, we're aware of it 
and we're we're strategically positioning ourselves to to maximize advantage minimize harm and and be prosperous and safe oh, no no thank you and richard uh final thoughts from you same same question key priorities in particular for the party going forward into the next election on this uh, well, firstly, I think I, I just so wholeheartedly agree with everything Ian just said and the way in which he put it, which was very succinct and beautiful, actually, in terms of how we need to be communicating to various communities. Look, I, I think, um, I actually think science needs to become uh, front and centre and mainstreamed in terms of uh, the way we speak to Australia and the way in which we seek a mandate. Um, you know, to me, um, if we're to uh, have a, an economy which makes things, which has the diversity of, of being an economy which has manufacturing in it, which in turn produces um, permanent, secure employment, um, and all of that has been diminishing over the last few years, that's all very kind of politically retail messages. Um, the truth of the matter is we're not going to be doing any of that um, as a first world nation unless we climb the technological ladder. I mean, what we, we see when it comes to successful countries that engage in uh, manufacturing is that they um, are doing it at the high value end. And, and, and to me, where I get to is that, you know, Australia should aspire to be the most modern country in the world because at the cutting edge of modernity lies prosperity. Um, but if we're gonna get there, um, we need to completely change our cultural relationship to science. I mean, science needs to be um, at the heart of the way in which we think about the world. And, uh, and I think there is actually a really exciting opportunity to do that coming out of um, this crisis. I think the, the point that Peter made earlier in his question is right. There, there, there is a, a kind of a renewed focus on, on science and, and its possibilities um, in terms of um, making the world a better place. But um, to me, it is, it is just completely essential that we make science a much bigger priority so that we can become a much more technologically advanced country. Because to be honest, I think things are heading in, or have been in the last um, seven or eight years in a direction which is different to that. And I, and I sort of leave you then with, the, with this idea in terms of why I talk about this as a, as a, a cultural question. Um, we, you know, the number of kids pursuing science has been on a steady decline over a, over a number of decades. That must change. Um, in terms of commercialising public research, we're just about the worst at it in the OECD. That must change. And on this day, the biggest scientific project in the world, um, the Square Kilometre Array Telescope, which is going to illuminate the heavens in a way that we've never seen before, which is going to answer questions around the existence of life elsewhere in the universe in all likelihood in the next decade, which will be a profound moment in the human experience. All of this is happening in Australia. And who knows that? I mean, it's not written about, it's not spoken about, it's not in our mainstream media. We've got this incredible thing happening, um, which is at its heart about science, um, and no one is even noticing. And when I look at those three things, the need for more kids to study science, the need for us to be not the worst in the OECD, but the best in terms of commercialising public research, and the fact that we've got the biggest science project in the world at the moment and no one knows about it, to me what that all says is, actually, we've got to really change our cultural relationship to science, but what a wonderful opportunity for Labor to champion that idea around being Australia being the most modern country in the world as being central to how we seek a mandate at the next election. Yeah, that's great. Look, and that's a fantastic note to end it on. Uh, we've run over a couple of minutes, so we're going to have to wrap up our discussion. On behalf of the Chifley Research Centre and the Labour Science Network, I'd like to thank our panellists, Richard Miles, Ian Chubb and uh, Annabelle Bly, for a fantastic discussion on an important and topical issue. I'd also like to thank everyone in the audience who could attend uh, tonight. We had a great turnout and we had some great questions. I'm sorry if we weren't able to get to your question today, but jump online on Twitter and Facebook to continue the conversation. Uh, please also be sure to keep up to date with further events hosted by Chipley Research Centre and the Labor Science Network via our respective Facebook sites and online. And uh, with that, I'd like to bid you all thank you and good night. Thank you. And a round of applause as well. Uh, thank <laughs> you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Much. Good evening. Thanks, Annabelle.
Thank you.